Hello, everybody. This is Alex Voss from TV eCourse, and uh, I want to talk to you about how television works. Now, you know, we, we're going to watch a public domain film, which is very old and talks about television as it was made way back when. However, the principles still apply. I'm a, I'm a broadcast engineer. I'm a member of the Society of Broadcast Engineers, and for years we were working with a system called 480i, which is 480 lines interlaced, and we had actually 525 lines with 480 visible with two fields uh, with 262 and one-half lines in one field and 262 and one-half lines in another field. And uh, that made up our broadcast, what we call NTSC, uh, standard definition television system. Well, of course, now here comes high def, and we have many forms of high def. We have the 1080i, which stands for 1080 interlaced, and then we have 720p, which stands for 720 lines vertical progressive. And when I say 1080i, 720p, 480i, I'm talking about vertical lines and then you have the amount of signal going across the horizontal line the number of pixels information on the horizontal line and that also gives you the, you know your quality your resolution your high definition resolution however scanning principles frame rate uh signals they're all still the same theory so if you understood the theory about how 480i works then you understand the theory behind 1080i uh, 720p or basically any television system on the planet that depends on scanning from the upper left hand corner and going to the right and then repeating lines all the way to the bottom and scanning back to the top sometimes in progressive you just do one scan sometimes in interlaced or interlaced what you do is you start in the upper left hand corner go to the right and scan to the bottom middle and you scan from the bottom middle back up to the middle top and you start there and you do your two fields and of course two fields make a frame the frame right the frame rate in television is 30 hertz, 29.958 if you want to be really technical, are 60 fields. That's to get around flicker so you don't see a flicker in the picture. Um, it, you know, compared to, tw uh, to film, which is 24. And so uh, there's a lot of basis in the theory of how television works. And so I've got this wonderful um, archive film made by uh, the u.s air force on how television works and uh, even though it's done way back when the theory still applies and the way they dissect an image still applies and so we can learn a lot from this and get a better understanding of how a tv works i appreciate you and let's go to the film now as the charges are removed from the plate the electric impulses dash from the camera to the control room through a special cable here, great pains are taken to keep them from getting muddled or out of proportion and to prevent any interference. The impulses are very weak at this point, so the engineers strengthen them through electronic tubes, like the tubes in your radio, to make them powerful enough to send over the air. Outside, they rush up a towering antenna and are released in the form of an extremely short radio wave, aimed directly for the transmitter. The transmitter, which acts as a link between the studio and the television audience, is always at a high altitude. This is because the distance over which television programs can be received satisfactorily is usually limited to the area between the top of the transmitter and the horizon. The higher the transmitter, the more distant the horizon and the greater the area reached. This site in the Helderberg Hills a few miles from Albany, New York, is a particularly good one. Within the horizon lies the entire New York State Capital District, so it's easy for people in Albany, Troy, Schenectady, and nearby towns and villages to tune in the programs. So much for that. Now for a trip to the relay station, a first and major step in the establishment of practical television networks. Because this station is at a still higher altitude and practically free from any noise or other interference, it manages to receive programs which are broadcast from New York City, 129 miles away, even though it is somewhat below the horizon, as seen from the top of the Empire State Building. As the station receives these programs from New York, it relays them to a receiving antenna at the transmitter, which, as you will notice, is within the horizon, as seen from the relay. At the transmitter, they are given greater power and rebroadcast all over the Capital District, completing the network, the first television network in history. 
It is here in the transmitter, while final checkups are being made, that all programs, from New York or otherwise, are at last released to the various television home receivers in and around the district. If you've never seen a television screen in the raw, this is what it looks like. Actually, it's part of a large glass tube developed in the wondrous electronic laboratories. The end of the tube is frosted on the inside with a sensitive chemical, the same type of chemical that is used in fluorescent lamps. This chemical backing, which forms the screen, is unusually sensitive to electric charges and will glow in response to them. So whenever television signals reach the tube, the screen gives off light and the amount of light it gives off depends on the strength of the electric impulses. Striking the chemical screen in order, the impulses are transformed back into the same points of light and shadow that make up the scene in front of the camera and our electric pictures become visible. The whole process from camera to receiver seems to take a lot of time and trouble, doesn't it? Yet in spite of the complications, in spite of the distance, we see whatever is being televised almost instantaneously.